All right, guys, we're in our last lecture for Industrial Revolution, and so we're going to be talking about what happens on the continent. How do they industrialize? At what point do they follow and catch up to Great Britain? We've been covering all this England stuff this whole time. And so um, I'm going to first introduce to you uh, two big names. Uh, first one is going to be Alexis de Tocqueville, and uh, he's a French historian and also known as a political thinker. And so um, most of his ideas are going to be following suit uh, with classical liberalism. And so do you kind of remember that um, I mentioned that classical liber liberalism is an offshoot, it's an outcome of the Enlightenment. And so he represents these ideals and he's um, participating in French politics and kind of also being um, a, an observer of society, a social critic, so to say. And he's you know, going around traveling throughout Europe, uh, he visits Britain and he begins to analyze the living standards um, and the conditions that many individuals of the working class are are um, having to live in, and <clears throat> he's comparing them to the rest of the continent. And so, um, in his visit to Manchester, um, he <clears throat> described it in this way. And so, I'm going to read this to you. Um, this is. Uh, quote from him, a sort of black smoke covers the city. Under his half daylight, 300,000 human beings are ceaselessly at work. The homes of the poor are scattered haphazard around the factories. From this filthy sewer, pure gold flows. In Manchester, civilized man is turned back almost into a savage. And so, yeah, I think it's pretty well written. Um, uh, you know, the point being that uh, this is what industrialization has come to. Um, that though, you know, you know, gold may be flowing because of um, all of the wealth and capital that's coming from the production of factories. Um, ultimately, the working people are the ones that are suffering. The homes of the poor are the ones that are, you know, filthy in, in, in all these ways. And so is it progress at all? That's the question, right? Uh, deep thought. Second one is Charles Dickens. I mentioned in class, um, you know, you've read... Um, tell two cities and so it's the best of times right in the worst of times and so the dual revolution uh, he's kind of uh, emphasizing just the realities of this time of um, late 18th century early 19th century um, and so as a realist he's going to be describing kind of uh, what's happening in England from what he sees from his experiences and his upbringing and um, yeah, he's going to be campaigning through his writings. And so some of the books that he has written are um, Oliver Twist, Christmas Carol, Great Expectations, uh, in addition to Tale of Two Cities, which I mentioned already. Um, he wants to bring awareness to a lot of the social problems uh, that the working class has, you know, experiences, just like Tocqueville. Um, and so uh, some of the things that he's going to be a critic of is the incessant child labor, um, the poverty levels and uh, just the different social classes during the Victorian era and so uh, other issues that he brings up is regarding just the working conditions and living conditions how you know unsanitary they are how dangerous they may be and um, you know essentially he believes that it's through his work that uh, you know his message can be heard and so uh, this is a quote from Dickens himself poets as unofficial legislators of the world right through uh, what you r are writing people can read and um, share uh, in understanding of these types of exploitations and do something about it right the point is that you want to legislate some reforms and so this is one way of kind of speaking up okay all right, so um, we're going to quickly look at the uh, map I have right here about the spread of industrialization. And so, you know, it, it first covers the industrial centers and uh, the manufacturing areas. And so you can kind of tell that you know, England has its kind of northern and central um, parts. And then uh, it, on the continent, there are some areas that... Uh, also see manufacturing come come through too, right? Uh, mainly, and I'll just you know I'll get into detail later. But uh, continental Europe, the rest of Europe, 
uh, will not industrialize until after 1815. That's for the most part. Now here, there's like, you know, spots here and there that weren't too far behind Britain in the 1780s when Britain first started. Um, but then, you know, we're going to see Britain definitely break away. Um, there were some continental countries that were able to kind of like steal some of the uh, British uh, engineering and inventions and, and ways of manufacturing, but that would definitely uh, be very difficult. And so that's why um, only some areas you could see them industrialize in that way. Okay. All right. So um, I want to talk a little bit about while, right, the dual revolution is going on, while um, England's going through the revolution, right, Napoleon is in power. And so the Napoleonic Wars, uh, which you guys have read about and took the test on, um, is, is going to come in contact with industrialization and how it actually will affect industrialization in the way that it would hinder uh, the growth on the continent. And so um, if you're in war, uh, you're going to notice that uh, no one's going to be like pushing to produce the most products and stuff because it's all about survival and um, being safe, right? And so a lot of trade was disrupted, uh, inflation increased, and the consumer demand. No one's going to be demanding for products when your country's in the middle of war, right? And so uh, that would definitely hurt the economies uh, on the continent. Also, the access to machinery and technology that the British had is going to be reduced because no one wants to go out to, you know, from Britain, no one wants to go out um, into a kind of a, a war-torn place that's kind of a war zone, right? And so that, that would be nonsensical, right? So but by 1815, uh, this is kind of where Britain has, you know, established itself where um, they've kind of pushed ahead while the rest of the continent has slowed down because of the Napoleonic Wars. And this is where they begin to dominate. And um, they are just too advanced in terms of their understanding of engineering, um, the technical knowledge that you need to build a machine or to run a factory. Um, most of the specialists, so to say, uh, like in the continent, just you know, weren't as knowledgeable compared to the British ones. And so um, even we talked about steam power, right, the steam engine, it was just way too expensive. And the, just the large amount of capital that was necessary and needed um, to follow suit um, in you know, building these factories, running these factories and stuff, it just could not be matched by the British, right? And so... Uh, the continental entrepreneurs would really struggle to acquire this capital, could not match the British, and also there would be a shortage of factory workers. I mean, off like maybe they might be off to war and, and fighting and, and stuff, or they not be may not be working because of the instability in their country because of this war. Um, that was understandable, okay? Uh, and so ultimately, within the continental countries, um, this was another difference: is that those that actually had wealth. Um, they didn't really push or, or authority, wealth or authority, right? They didn't really push for industrialization. Whereas with, with Britain, we talked about they had a political advantage, right? And so uh, by passing uh, proper acts and laws that would protect business owners and entrepreneurs and stuff, uh, that's going to promote industrial growth, but there wasn't that same type of support, okay? Um, so if you look at kind of the maps on the side, you can see that uh, you know, by 1800, there are just the major cities, and most of them are going to be capital cities, some are not, right? But those cities have been cities since, you know, like, centuries ago, right? But, you know, by 1900, we can see this urbanization movement. So just kind of give you guys the um, the visual of, you know, all of that uh, migration from rural to urban, okay? All right, so to finish up, um, and I know this is a very quick lecture, so that's good. Um it's at 1815, after the Napoleonic Wars, right? After Napoleon defeated. This is where there is that shift, right? And so I think this is a great map. Uh, if you take a look, right, the dark maroon is showing that uh, England is the so-called so -called cradle, where it all begins, right? Um, the cradle of the Industrial Revolution. And you can kind of tell, you know, as it goes into the orange, into the yellow, into the green, it's really a radius of influence of, you know, the closer you are to Britain, Right, the quicker that you have, you know, um, came in contact with their industrial technology, with their knowledge, with their economic system and stuff, and so you've learned quicker, adapted quicker. Um, but it takes time, right? And so, um, 
How did they do so? Well, after 1815, they caught up because, for first, they learned from the mistakes Britain made. And so during the early industrialization period, you know, everyone makes mistakes. Britain made plenty of mistakes, and that kind of cost them some years. And so they tried to learn from those mistakes ahead of time. And they would borrow the technology by hiring British engineers. And they would uh, try to trade and just invite um, British entrepreneurs to come and um, invest into their countries. Okay, um, And so... Industrialization is going to differ uh, for each country after 1815. So if we look at the map, we see in orange, we have Belgium, we have the Netherlands, we have slash Holland, you should, we have France, and also the United States not on the map, but uh, this they are going to uh, go through their own industrial revolutions in around the 1820s. Okay, That's when they're going to start. And uh, to follow after that, it's going to be Germany, Austria, and Italy, uh, around you know 1840, 1850 is when uh, they have become industrialized, right? Mid 1800s. Uh, one thing to know about Germany, though, and this is going to be kind of throughout this semester, is that Germany will actually surpass Britain in its industrialization process. And so by 1900, right before World War One is about to start, in just you know 50, 60 years time span, Germany becomes the most uh, industrialized country in Europe, okay, and it's because uh, they were really pushing for this, and I'll explain one last component to that. Um, Eastern Europe is going to be kind of even slower than that. Eastern Europe includes Russia, and this is going to affect them also uh, later in World War I, um, is that they don't industrialize to the late 1800s, and so they only have, you know, like a couple decades at most to really catch up to um, what, you know, Great Britain went through a century ago, right? Um, so how are they able to do this besides learning from mistakes and borrowing technology? Well, uh, there's two things. One, uh, they have to allow the government to centralize its power and to then say, you know, this is the direction of what our country needs, and that's economic development. And so they're going to create banking systems that will promote essential native primary industries uh, in order for them to industrialize, right? So for example, um, a bank would invest its money it would give out like give out loans and stuff and now they're called industrial banks and so the point is most of these investments are going to build up the infrastructure of the of the country meaning railroads and other heavy industries which we mentioned with machinery and stuff so banks are going to be loaning out money in this way the government is encouraging this and then you know slowly but surely over time over the decades uh, you have um you know, the, the use of the initial capital that was not there, but now, you know, it's going to be paid back, but then because your economy is going, they're able to pay it back, okay? Um, one French bank is called the Credit uh, Mobiler, and so this is in Paris, and they uh, are an example of how they were able to help finance France uh, to build railroads throughout France and connecting it, right, increasing transportation, but also um, loading out money to other European countries who would need that as well, okay? So, um, we know that, you know, um, the British had a monopoly for a period of time as far as coal, as far as cotton, as far as, um, I thought the last one was iron, yes, iron. Um, but, you know, they were unable to hold on to it for forever. I mean, as much as they tried to, uh, there are factors that hindered them from doing so. Um, and so, obviously, because, you know, eventually those countries will industrialize. And even today, you can't really tell which countries are more and less industrialized because most of Europe now is industrialized. Um, so how were they ultimately unsuccessful uh, for a couple of factors? One, um, Britain did their best to uh, prohibit any types of skilled workers, engineers, or artisans that knew, right, how technology and machinery and just like craft making and building that was very profitable, they made it illegal and prohibited these guys from actually leaving Britain, right? Like you're not allowed, okay? Because they want to protect that knowledge, that intellectual capital, so to say. Um, by 1843, even exporting any type of textile machinery or any other equipment that's used in that industry was also forbidden. forbidden. And so, you know, they're doing their best to basically kind of like lock it down and so that they can maintain this dominance uh, but there's always ways around it right smuggling um, illegal immigration right these are 
ways where things leak out and that, that happens and so why would people do it well mainly for profitable reasons and so not only that the uh, continental countries would counter um, the just the rising cost of British goods by put, tacking on tariffs right so if I'm France right I'm going to put it on high tariffs on a lot of these British imports and so by doing that um, the domestic goods in France are going to be, you know, like a, you know, more um, appealing in price because it's more affordable compared to the high, highly taxed British import, right? And so that's how you encourage your 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 country, your citizens, your civilians to buy domestically. Okay. Um, all right. So one last concept I want to bring up is Zolverine, and uh, Zolverine was a a system where a lot of the German states um, would protect one another. And so they're creating their own tariff on German imports. And so um, just like how France would do so, a lot of the German states, you know, um, didn't always work together. But this is now, right, a, what was once the Confederation of the Rhine. Uh, you have um, the economic support of each German state where they created a free trade zone among all the German states so that uh, they can equally protect one another and then they would trade freely without taxing and creating tariffs towards one another and hurting each other's economies, right? And so uh, the most significant results of the Solverein, uh was that it allowed them to increase production, right, at a steady rate and um, manufacture the goods that need to to sell to their own um, consumers and, and, and citizens and stuff. Okay, all right, so we finished Industrial Revolution and we are pushing forward because as of today we have 93, 92 days left until the AP test.